If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this. Night shift workers, what is the scariest paranormal encounter you have ever had? I worked in a residential program for teenage girls. They were housed in historic buildings donated to the program by the town, so they were from the 1800s and certainly had a creepy air about them at times. I worked the overnight shifts and would have to do bed checks with a flashlight every 30 minutes, but the room around the corner and at the end of the hall always made my hair stand on end. It was just an oppressive, watched kind of feeling. Sometimes I would swear I could feel someone following me as I walked back to my desk, and I even thought I heard footsteps a couple of times. After a few months of working there, I was talking with the girl who stayed in that room. When I mentioned that it must be nice to be the only person without a roommate, she said, I'd rather have a roommate than stay in there. There's a shadowy person that stands over my bed and watches me sometimes. It makes it really hard to sleep. She wasn't one to make up stories, and when she told me that she often feels watched or followed when she's in her room, a chill ran down my spine. Supposedly, the children's house is even more notoriously haunted, and people have seen figures lurking around several times. We always tried to keep our cool about it to keep the kids from being scared, but there were honestly some nights where I was afraid to do bed checks. I started my job as a care assistant in a nursing home in 2019. The home used to be an old orphanage, which explained the noises of children laughing and crying and also the noise of balls bouncing and little footsteps. There are four floors in the nursing home, and on each floor, the staff and most residents working on those floors would often see the lady in white or a woman in black. There are multiple stories where staff share their own experiences with each other, but this was mine. On one particular shift, I started my day with the usual routine of coffee and made my way to the first room. As I was walking into the room, I saw a woman dressed in a long black old-fashioned dress slowly come out of the room next door. I rubbed my eyes as my heart sank, and she was gone. I carried on my usual routine, and the lady I was seeing at the time said, that woman has been in here again. I asked what woman she was talking about, knowing full well that I had just seen her and that I was shitting myself. She then went on to tell me that when she comes, it's either me or one of my neighbors that have to go. I was confused, scared, and carried on asking her as many questions about this woman as I could. The lovely lady didn't speak for the rest of my time in her room. This was on my mind for the rest of my 12-hour shift. So this happened roughly six years ago in Pennsylvania, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I was working for Burger King at the time and just got off my night shift at roughly midnight. As I was driving home, I saw a light that was about 50 feet off the ground. It had an orangish glow, like a streetlight. I could see it very clearly. The night sky was clear, with no fog at all. I thought it was just a new streetlight that got put up. I just kept staring at it. Out of nowhere, it shot straight up in the air and just vanished. It gave me chills and made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Ever since that day, I always look at the sky on my drives home from the job I have now. Could it be extraterrestrial? I kind of just want some potential insight on what happened to me two years ago. I was in Portugal volunteering at a wolf sanctuary that was pretty far into some wooded mountains but not extremely deep in the woods, less than a day's walk. The wolf sanctuary was pretty secluded, though, with very little staff and volunteers. At this time, there were only six people, including myself, within a five-ish mile radius, and I did not receive any cell reception. Thankfully, the office had some Wi-Fi, and I got the cabin closest to it. One night, I believe, four days into volunteering there, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to go down to the office cabin to just mess around on my phone. I don't know exactly how long I was there, but it was between 1 to 3 a.m. I thought I heard something from the woods, so I kind of just froze and listened carefully. After a few seconds, I realized it was something saying my name in a frantic yet silent way. When I finally realized what was happening, I booked it back to my cabin at full sprint and locked the doors and windows, the windows had wood doors, so I shut those too. I tried to calm down and make sense of what happened, but I couldn't because I kept hearing random tapping on the outside of the cabin. Eventually I got to a point where I was exhausted, so I just put on some music to cover the tapping and went to sleep. When I woke up and met with the staff and volunteers in the morning to get ready to feed the wolves, I asked if anyone was out last night. Everyone said no, and honestly, I believe them because whatever was saying my name that night did not sound like anyone I've ever heard before. To this day, I feel like I can't talk about it without people thinking I'm crazy. I'm just curious if anyone has any ideas on what happened that night. So I used to work as a security officer. I was asked to work a Saturday night shift at an old warehouse in Dudley. I turned up at 5 p.m., and the building was a huge brick warehouse with some makeshift offices at the front. I walked in, took the keys from the day officer, and locked the doors behind him. 
Everything seemed normal for a while, it was a bit creepy as the building was so old, but I was used to that. Around 1am, I got a call from the warehouse manager. One of his night drivers had forgotten his paperwork and asked me to go into the office, right at the back of the warehouse, and collect it for him so he could come pick it up. I said fine and headed to the office. The warehouse was pitch black. I had a small torch, but it only slightly lit my way. I walked through until I got to the office door, which was a huge metal sliding door. It made a screeching noise as I pulled it open. As I walked in, in front of me was the office fax machine, which was blinking, and the paperwork was printed out. I grabbed the paperwork, but as I turned around, I looked to the other end of the office and saw what I can only describe as a dark figure, hunched over, shivering. I could hear what sounded like breathing, but as if you were freezing cold. I stood there for about 30 seconds motionless, staring at this figure. I turned back slowly and closed the door behind me, rushing back to the front office, where I locked the door and waited for the driver. An hour later, the driver collected his paperwork, and for the rest of the night, I'd convinced myself it was just the dark playing tricks with me, but that didn't stop me from unlocking the office door or checking the cameras every few minutes. 5 a.m. turned up, and I got a knock on the door from the day officer. I handed him the keys and expected him to come in, but he locked the door from the outside. I asked him if he was going in. He said he doesn't go inside when there's nobody else in, but sits in his car in the car park and waits. I said that's a bit strange. He looked at me and asked if I went anywhere else other than the security office. I told him that I went to the back office to get paperwork for a driver, not telling him about the other part. I'll never forget the look he gave me or how sad he was then. He looked me in the eyes and said, well, then you know why I don't go in there alone then. It gave me chills, but I shrugged it off and just said okay then and left for home. Safe to say, on the way home, I called my office and requested not to go back there. I just got home from my job delivering pizzas in a small town in North Carolina, and my heart is still pounding from what I saw tonight. I just started recently, and this was my first night shift. I hope it's my last. I was going back to the store after a delivery a little after 9 o'clock when I saw it riding towards me on a bicycle. It looked like a person for the most part, but it was wearing one of those blank plastic Halloween masks you can get at any store. The mask had a wavy line from the top left, wearer's right, to the bottom right, which separated the mask into a purple half and an orange half. I couldn't tell what it was wearing because it was too dark and the clothes were black. Out of the top of the mask, there was something that could have been hair, but it seemed strange to me. The hair was at least a foot tall on its own, and the only way I can describe it is as a plant of some sort. It looked like a bunch of tangled branches and vines, all sprouting from the thing's head. It was doing a wheel stand all the way down the street towards me without losing an iota of balance. The thing that really tipped me off that this thing wasn't human, though, was the aura it gave off. I couldn't stop looking at it for more than a second. It drew my eyes almost magnetically, and every second I looked at it, the more terrified I felt. It wasn't just my natural reaction to fear either, this was powerful and evil. My head started pounding, I was screaming involuntarily, and tears welled up in my eyes. I was about to make a turn when I saw it coming towards me, and as soon as I completed the turn, barely able to look at where I was going, the thing disappeared. I turned around to look back down the street I was just on, and it was just gone. I was still extremely rattled, panting and whining like a dog, but I knew I had to make it back to the store. I made a slight left onto the long avenue where my store is located when I saw it riding towards me again, still doing a wheel stand. It started out on my right but rode around me to get on my left as I proceeded toward the store. I was trying my best to outrun it, but it was keeping up with me exactly until it suddenly jumped off the bike onto the sidewalk and caught it without effort. I was still screaming and tearlessly crying this whole time, but I whipped my truck into the store lot, hoping it meant safety. To my horror, I saw a bicycle, not belonging to anyone in the store, leaned up against the wall directly in front of my parking spot. I looked across the street to where I had seen the thing hit the ground and saw that nothing was there. I hesitated to even leave my truck, but I had to complete my shift, so I went inside with my guard up as much as it could be considering how terrified I was. My co-workers were all fine, but there were no customers in the store. That's not unusual considering the time of night, but that meant that the bicycle's owner was MIA. I rubbed my face for a few moments in front of a fan and grabbed my next delivery. I exited the store to discover the bicycle was gone, even though I hadn't noticed anyone move it. I worked the rest of my shift until 10 o'clock and didn't see the thing again. That's not to say that there was nothing out of the ordinary, but the bike stalker was gone, at least. The whole way home, I was unnaturally paranoid. Around every curve and corner, I feared it would be standing in the road waiting for me. I could see it in my head. 
The vision I had of it standing on a certain bridge on my way home felt so real that I nearly drove into the creek. I'm home now in what I hope is safety, but I'm definitely still on edge. I've seen a lot of things in my 20 years, but I have never experienced anything like that. This was a couple of years ago, when I was still in college. I worked at my local high school in South Jersey on the night shift for some extra money, but unfortunately, the hours meant I didn't really get to have a life during the week. I got a call from my friend group on a Friday before I headed into work saying that they were going to explore Clinton Road, which was known to be the scariest road in NJ. Obviously, I couldn't go, so I told them to let me know how they made out. Later in the night, I get a call from them in panic, saying all these crazy things happened to them. They described what happened to them, how they threw coins over the ghost boy bridge and they came back, a ghost truck following them, and the feeling of being watched. I thought they were just hyping it up because I missed out. So it was decided we'd all go the next night, but this time, I got to see it for myself, something I'd regret for the rest of my life. Being from South Jersey, Clinton Road is a bit of a drive for us, about two hours, so there was plenty of time for us to get all hyped up and spooked out. Now I can only describe myself as the manly man of the group, being 6 feet 5 inches and 260. Especially back then, I had the persona of, ah, it's all made up, nothing will scare us. Boy, was I wrong? Right when we got there, the entire vibe changed from oh, we're all going to be spooked. Oh, wait, this is actually pretty damn creepy. The road is in the middle of the woods, and houses are few and far between. The first thing we see when we get there is a small, mini castle looking building, which is the best way I can describe it. And because of the long ride, we all had to pee. So I went to the left, friend 2, Joe, went straight, and friend 3, Har, went to the right. Friend 4 was a female who stayed behind us on the road. After I was done, I immediately walked back along with Har, but we noticed Joe walking towards the creepy building. I start shouting, asking what he was doing, and he turns back around with a look of shock. Me being completely confused? I ask, what are you doing walking there? Joe swore up and down that I was actually behind the building, waving at him to follow me to the building. So naturally, we are all getting freaked out. We pull up to the bridge, the ghost boy, and I check everyone for coins to make sure they don't fake it just to scare me. We all throw the coins, nothing happens. Ah, see guys, it's all in your head, let's go, so we all start walking back to the car. Cling, cling, cling. I hear the coins hitting the road. We sprint back to check, and we find the coins laying on the road. I was 100% convinced they were just messing with me. So I had the idea to mark a coin so they couldn't fake it. I threw the coin in the water, waited 5 minutes in silence, and nothing happened. See guys, let's go. Cling, cling, cling. I hear coins in the road. I walk back. I'll be damned. It was a coin with the same exact markings I put on it. I'm extremely freaked out at this point, so we decide to go. Driving down the windy road in a newer sports car, we are all freaked out and just want to leave. We see headlights appear seemingly out of nowhere behind us. Did not see them attached to a vehicle. I'm no car expert, but I bet my life they were lights on an old truck. Getting closer the faster we went, taking bends at fast speeds that even a new truck wouldn't handle. Suddenly, the lights disappeared. So now, all in panic, we decide to pull over to map our way out. Dead silence, no light except our headlights in the woods. We hear the typical woman ghosts moan, and of course, what came with it was the typical woman in white dress standing in the woods right next to our car, and she let out the loudest scream I have ever heard. We are scrambling at this point to get out of Dodge. Once we make it back to the main roads, we decide to dig a little deeper on this road. Apparently the ghost truck tries to make people crash on the dead man's curve. There have been numerous bodies buried there by the famous murderer the Ice Man. On our way home, we were so ballsy and wanted to go back again the next night, Sunday. We suddenly pass an old, run-down church that looks like it hasn't been used in 50 years. And of course, the sign left out front says, you need Jesus on Sunday. It is safe to say that I never went back, and even up to this day, the friend group still refuses to talk about what happened that night on Clinton Road. I work in private duty nursing. One of my patients lives out in the countryside, in a small trailer. His street is the only residential one within a one-mile radius. His room has a door to the back. Behind the trailer are nothing but shrubs and trees. Anyway, the family has like three dogs who don't really make that much noise. At first, they would bark at me, but they stopped once they got to know me. One night, it was like 3 a.m., and it was cold as duck. I started hearing the dogs bark like crazy. At first, I thought they saw a raccoon, a possum, or a tlacuig, 
so I thought nothing of it. Suddenly, I hear a knock on the door. I froze up, thinking about who it could be. I know it wasn't a family member since they were asleep and the dogs don't bark at them. I wait for a couple of seconds to think about what to do. I waited it out and didn't hear a second knock. After a while, the dogs stopped barking. About an hour later, I decided to look outside. I didn't see anybody there. I forgot about the whole thing for the night, thinking that maybe I just imagined someone knocking and the dogs really were just barking at some animal. My shift ends, and I go home to get some sleep. The next day, I'm at my patient's trailer again. The parents are about to go to sleep, so I give them a brief report. They are about to go to sleep when the mom turns around and says, if someone knocks, don't open the door. I still work there. When I worked on a ward, when I started my nurse training, I heard, nurse, nurse. In a male voice coming from an empty room, I thought maybe it was another patient calling, so I went and did my checks, but there was only one other woman, and she was asleep. I went back to the nurse's station, and the buzzer kept going off for the empty room where I heard the noise, so I walked around the corner to check it out, and I saw an old man poke his head around the corner. I remember it as clear as day, and this was a couple years ago. He was wearing blue striped pajamas and had a full head of white hair. My heart literally sank, and I got really cold, with goosebumps all over my body. I ran back to the station and told someone else to go check it out. I was pretty shaken up about the whole thing. I spoke to the doctor on shift about it, and he just said, well, it's a hospital, what do you expect? Lol. We did go check it out eventually, and the room was still empty. Now I'm an ER nurse, and I'm kind of hardened up to the stuff. I have so many ghost stories from colleagues, but that's the only thing that's really scared me. I'm from Australia, and I used to work at a 24-7 rural petrol station in a small town called Barham. It's on the Murray River, and if you don't know, there are quite a lot of spooky stories around the river. If you ask any locals, they will have a story to tell. Anyway, when I started the job, I was told not to mind the shadows that you may see getting picked up on the security cameras. As these cameras were constantly recording, you could watch the cameras on a small TV behind the counter. My boss said that they come and go around the petrol pumps, and sometimes the lights would go out over the pumps. He said to ignore it, and if you want, you can stay in the back room until a customer walks in. When I asked why, what were they? In the most Aussie way possible, he goes, because they aren't customers, they aren't your friends, and F ket SHT happens if you acknowledge them. With this, I started my first graveyard shift. Lucky for me, they had put someone else on the shift with me because I was new, but that didn't prepare me for that night. It got to about 2 a.m. in the morning before things started to get weird. Every now and then the fridge lights would flicker, or the radio would go in and out of static, but what was truly unsettling was watching this figure on the cameras going back and forth just on the edge where the overhead lights for the pump stopped and beyond just being pitch black road. The other worker, whose name was Tony, could also see it and seemed to try and ignore it, it felt like he was trying to not seem spooked for my sake, bless you, Tony. What was strange was that when car headlights shone onto the road where the figure was pacing, it just vanished, confirming that it wasn't physical. When the owner of the car finished filling up and came to the counter to pay, I tried my hardest not to look like I'd just seen a ghost, but what the man said to me next just tipped me over that night. He said, I just had my first experience of a ghost car. I see his tail lights, and then he is suddenly gone. Creepy SHT out in the bush tonight. The understatement of the year. Needless to say, I am not ashamed to admit that I quit that job after four days, as I could not bring myself to work another night shift at that place, and still, to this day, I don't know how anyone could. It was a wild experience. We fast forward a few months later, and I had gone to a mate's house for a bonfire on his parents' property, we would call this a gatho, we would burn off garden waste, and sit around the fire having a chat with a few drinks and maybe a joint to share, it was always very chill. It was mid-July, so it was quite a cold night. Now, this is a small town so it's not uncommon to know everyone, especially teenagers. So it was no surprise to see Tony from the petrol station at the Gatho. I knew I had to pick this guy's brain for some context on what happened that night. As soon as I sat down to chat with him, we got to talking, and I remember him saying, you know, you got out of that place at the right time. I asked him why that was. Did something happen? He then said, one of them managed to speak. I saw the shadow pacing, but then it started to call my name. I remember at this point that poor Tony looked really uncomfortable, and I remember his eyes getting teary when he said, it sounded like my mom, she passed away when I was like, 12. He struggled so hard to get the next part out. It showed up every night after that, using the same voice, asking me to come outside. I quit about two weeks after you did because of that, 
and I still can't get the voice out of my head. It sounded like my mom, but it was way too sinister. When he said that last part, I felt that chill you get in your butt cheeks. You know that what you are being told is legit. Even if this wasn't a paranormal encounter, whatever Tony did hear or see really got him. After that, a few more of us joined in the conversation. We talked about our encounters and other things we saw out in the bush. I now live in Mianjin slash Brisbane. City life is completely different, but the paranormal doesn't stop. Ever since that night, I have had a huge interest in the paranormal and started to find tools for skeptical thinking. I learned pretty quickly that most of the time, paranormal activity can definitely be explained, but I do have a few more stories of encounters I have had that I cannot explain to this day. But Barham will forever be the most haunted place I've ever lived. I'm convinced that the land is haunted there. This is my dad's story. As a teen, he lived in a really small town in Louisiana. His father took care of the cemetery grounds and dug graves for a local, old church, so my dad would help out for some spare cash. This church was in the middle of the woods, and none of the priests stayed in the area overnight. My dad and his friends would go to the cemetery and get incredibly drunk on weekends. They wandered around the cemetery, but were respectful enough not to disturb or ruin the graves. Well, there was this one bush near the new chain-link fence towards the back that my drunk dad and his drunk friends liked. They would sit near the bush and wait for it to start talking to them. They talked to the bush, and it talked back to them. My dad says he was so drunk that he couldn't remember exactly what it was saying, but they had conversations with this bush every weekend for months. Now, he chalked it all up to drunken delusions. Until his father told him to go get rid of the bush because it was messing up the fence and starting to die. My dad did as he was told, slowly chopping it up. But something was out of the ordinary. As soon as he removed enough of it, it became apparent that there was a simple, flat gravestone underneath all of it. He couldn't read the words on it anymore, it was so old. They decided not to touch the bush or the grave any further. The bush never grew back, only a few stumps around it remain. I've seen it. We live up in New England, and we traveled down to bury my grandmother's urn in that cemetery. My dad took me to the remains of the talking bush and grave and was like, remember the talking bush? Yeah, here it was. I work in a building where four people were killed in a pretty brutal accident. The place has decades of individual accounts of weird shit happening. I've been through some long night shifts. Sometimes we work alone in a section of the building, and, man, it can get creepy. People hear women speaking and laughing. I've heard it too. You swear you hear it, but you're alone. It's right there, but far away. One person lost their keys from their belt ring. He walked back to the break area to give whoever took them a hard time. No one knew what he was talking about, so he walked back through the building alone. He turns a corner, and just behind him in the dark, he hears keys hit the floor. He said he nearly shit his pants. He heads back a few steps, and there are his keys on a work table, not the floor. He booked it out of there. Tells the story often. Another woman wouldn't use the women's locker room because the first night she worked in the building, she heard crying. She described it as a small sniffling cry, but it was as clear as anything. She expected a woman to be sitting on the bench between the lockers, crying. No one was there. Lastly, something I've experienced. The building can be pretty big and open in some areas. When you sit with your back to the open space, it's not uncommon to feel completely sure that someone is coming up behind you. I've many times whipped around completely prepared to see someone. It's the weirdest feeling. I just know someone is drawing close, reaching out to grab my shoulder, and I freak. No one's ever there. This is a personal experience I had several years ago, either in 2015 or 2016. At the time, I was working as a second shift mechanic at a trucking company 30 miles from where I lived. I became good friends with one of the mechanics on my shift, and we would often hang out after the shift ended. We both lived in the same town and would usually grab a case of beer on the way home since gas stations were still open close to midnight. There was a spot in the woods behind my house that I had turned into a fire pit, and on most occasions, he would follow me home so we could drink there and not worry about bothering anybody at the late hour. One night after we punched off the time clock, we agreed to hang out like any other night. But this time he couldn't follow me home, I don't remember the reason since it was a while ago, but instead he could meet me at the church up the road from my house. I purchased the beer, get to the church parking lot, and wait for him to arrive. Now some time has passed and he is nowhere to be seen, so I figured I would get out of my car and watch the road, looking for headlights. I finally see his truck pull into the lot, and he pulls up beside my car, which I am leaning against. We decide to hang out at the church for a bit before we depart for my place, both of us leaning against our vehicles, facing the headstones. Now things get weird, we were talking, 
And then he cuts me off mid-sentence and says, do you see that? See what? I said. He said he saw movement and pointed to a headstone several rows up from the curb of the parking lot. I focused in that direction for a moment, but honestly, I couldn't see whatever he had seen. He seemed very taken back by it, and I could tell he wasn't joking by his expression. I asked him what exactly it was he had seen, to which he replied, a dark shadow rocking back and forth. Whether I believed him fully or not, hearing his description gave me cold chills. I asked if he had a means of defense, and he showed the 9mm mark on his hip. Even still, he was in no way ready to walk up there and investigate the headstone. I decided to check it out, and I crossed the pavement onto the grass. Now this church is pretty well lit by a half dozen light poles, and the only shadows that were cast were by the headstones themselves. I start looking around on the third row, and I'm instantly hit with dread. About 15 feet in front of me is a pitch black figure sitting against one of the stones. Its head was between its knees and was rocking steadily back and forth, exactly as my buddy described. How he could have seen it from the car, I do not know. But even worse to think about was that I had been alone with this thing unnoticed the entire time. I ask if he or she is alright and get no response, only a faint whimpering as if it were mourning the loss of whoever was buried at the grave. I figured grave visitations weren't unusual, but at midnight, that's ducking eerie. I walk closer to the figure until I am standing three feet from it, and I am going to speak out again until my blood runs absolutely cold. There is light illuminating the figure and somewhat of the surrounding ground, and unlike anything I have ever seen, the light seemed to just absorb into the blackness of the figure. I could see no defining features, I couldn't make out shoes, hair, or hats, and the separation of clothing was telling me this was a human being in my presence. The whimpering turned into louder, more aggressive moans, and somehow, keeping my military composure, I backed away slowly, then ran down to my buddy and told him we needed to get the hell out of there immediately. And we did. About an hour later, we returned to the cemetery, but the figure was gone. We are no longer friends, but I still like to tell this story since it's the only real experience I've had of this kind. Still to this day, I have no idea what it was we saw that night. When I was a young 18-year-old lad who was tired of working fast food, I stopped by a nursing home that I drove by every day and literally asked for a job. No experience, just an almost expired CNA license from high school. Somehow I got the job, but on my first day, they had me cook breakfast for the first residence. I didn't know squat about care, but I knew I could cook. Trying to make a good impression, I set the table and got to cooking. They got everyone ready and sat at the table. One of the residents who had dementia was having some emotional issues, and both of the caregivers attended to her, trying to calm her down. Now I am facing the wall directly away from them, and I have both long hallways to my right and left in my peripheral vision. Down the hall to my left, I notice a resident step out of her room. She is clearly not ready to be up because she has her blue and white checkered nightgown on. It was as clear as day. She's a small thing, maybe 5 feet 2 inches, with long white hair. She steps into the hall and just watches me. Once all the plates are dished up and handed out, I look back down the hall, and she notices me looking at her. She turns and walks into the unlit office across from the room she walked out of. I happily walk down the hall into the office and introduce myself while turning on the light. There is only one door to the office. There are some filing cabinets, one desk, one chair, and nothing else. Vanished. I'm scratching my head when the caregivers come over to kindly ask what the hell I'm doing. I explain what I saw and how she's vanished when the caregiver gets incredibly uncomfortable and has me explain it to caregiver number two when she starts shivering and pulls up a picture on her phone and says, is this the lady you saw? Sure enough, it was. That lady happened to pass six weeks prior in that very room where she walked out of. I never thought something like that could look so ducking real. To this day, I get uncomfortable thinking about how long that lady watched me and how she reacted when I finally looked back. It turned out she would be the least of my worries because I never saw or felt her again. I worked there for a year and a half, and things got damn wild, but all my SHT was verified by both day and night shifts. I work in a care home, death isn't uncommon, but one thing that always pops up is the man in the top hat although we workers try to keep it quiet from the residents so they don't question it or panic. Initially, because I work in a care home for those with dementia and Alzheimer's, I always put them saying they saw a man in a top hat as something to do with their illness. However, it began to change after I had many ghostly encounters in the care home. I only recently asked my shift leader about the paranormal activity at the care home, as I knew she had worked here for years and done night shifts all her life. She told me about many ghosts, who they are, and what they do, but what stood out the most was the man in the top hat. My mom and sister also work in the care home, so I decided to ask my mom this morning about the man in the top hat. 
she told me how it's deemed the death doctor, and many people had seen it, not only residents. Apparently, he's been seen at night lingering at the doorways of residents' rooms or windows. Shortly after, the resident whom he visited would die. Whether it took an hour, a day, or a week, death would be inevitable for them. One story that stood out that my manager told me was that once she took a passed away client to the toilet, she was fine, could dress herself, feed herself, etc. She was a perfectly normal old lady, except for her deteriorating dementia. She began to go crazy and scream about feeling a worm crawl inside her and seeing a thin silhouette of a man in a top hat and black coat in her bathroom with her. She then turned back to normal, finished on the toilet, stood up, but then instantly just dropped dead. If anyone has any stories about the man in the top hat and genuinely believes in him the way I do, please reach out. I work in a nursing home, and my schedule consists of days, evenings, and nights. It's rough transitioning between days and nights, but everyone that works here has the same shifts, so we just get through them together. The building has about 100 residents and has three floors. The building is shaped like an L with a north and south wing and the nursing stations in the middle. The third floor currently only has a few residents living there due to construction, with one of the wings completely shut down because they're ripping out the walls. Due to only a few residents being on that floor, only one nurse is required to be on duty on that floor. I've worked the night shift alone on that floor many times and have never really experienced anything scary or weird. Sure, it's creepy and dark at night, but that was it. I've never believed in the paranormal at all. I had the mindset that I had to see it to believe it. I'm a huge fan of true crime and scary movies and stories, as well as true crime and paranormal documentaries, however. Over the years, a few of my co-workers have talked about how the third floor is haunted. They'd hear knocks at night and see weird things. I was always intrigued to hear about it, but we would always just laugh it off. But that night a few weeks ago has really started to change my mind. I was sitting in the nursing station, watching movies and playing on my phone. I had just done my rounds and had answered a call bell. I felt off that night and constantly had that feeling of being watched. I also kept on thinking that I was seeing things out of the corner of my eye. The next part is hard to explain, but I'll try as best I can. As I was sitting there, all of a sudden, a shadow dropped from the ceiling and hovered over me, but by the time I realized what I was seeing, it was gone. My heart jumped, and I jumped out of my chair. There was no way it would be a shadow from anything or a car passing by, as the only window looked out into the forest, with nothing but trees for miles. After a few moments, I calmed down and left the nursing station to go check on my residents. Nothing seemed amiss, and none of them were awake except for the little old lady at the end of the hall, watching her TV shows. As I walked back to the nursing station, I swore I saw feet or a shadow moving under the crack of the door leading to the wing that was closed for construction. I opened the door just to make sure it wasn't a wandering resident from another floor, which happens quite often, but there was no one there. I walked back to the nursing station, freaked out, still feeling like someone or something was watching me. I settled back into my chair and tried to watch TikTok videos to get my mind off of it. I was sitting with my back to the window, facing the door. After about an hour of watching videos, I glanced at the clock. It was 3.03. I remember being slightly annoyed as my coworker had promised to come up at 2.50 so I could have my break and go out to my car to have a smoke. Unhealthy, I know. I'm trying to quit, but that night, I needed one. All of a sudden, I hear three knocks on the window behind me. I jumped up, looked out the window, and there was nothing there. Flight mode took over, and I just started down the hall, running into my coworker who was just coming off the elevator. Now bear in mind that I'm on the third floor, which is pretty high up. There was no stairway, tree, or ladder outside that window, so it was impossible for a person to be outside knocking on the window. I immediately asked my coworker if she had knocked or heard any knocking, and she said no. She could see how shaken up I was and she offered to switch floors for the remainder of the shift. I was very thankful, as being on the second floor means you're with another nurse, so I wouldn't be alone. I went out to my car, had a few smokes, and just tried to calm down. I talked to the nurse on the second floor, and she didn't seem too surprised. She's heard knocking up there and has seen and heard things she can't explain. A lot of people have died up there, and after that night, I honestly don't know what to believe anymore. I haven't ever felt fear like I did that night, and I've since worked a few night shifts up there and didn't experience anything like that again. Could it be that I was just tired? I don't know. But I won't ever forget how I felt that night. Let me start by setting the stage for this encounter that happened a few years back. It was Christmas night and I work at a decent size factory in New England as a security guard for the night shift. The factory was built in 1900 and is located at the end of a residential suburban street which was common for the time. 
Being at Christmas night all other employees and guards but myself were home for the holidays as I sat in the security office which is detached from the main building next to gate 1. Around 2 a.m. I look up from the computer monitor to see three girls on the younger side, maybe 12 or 13 about 20 yards away standing at the telephone pole staring directly at me. It's not uncommon to see children in the area as it's a neighborhood, but at 2 a.m. on Christmas night. Come on. I tried to ignore it and continued to look down at the computer monitor until only about 20 seconds later I look up startled hearing tapping on the locked office door. And you guessed it. It was the girls. A confused and nervous look painted my face as the girls just started giggling. C.A. Can I help you I raised my voice. They stood there with an evil grin on their pale faces. Let us in they said as their what looked to be black eyes stared right through me. At this point I was speechless. My heart just sank at realizing how creepy this situation was. I told them to go away with a stern voice and got up and shut the lights. No sooner did I sit back down they were right back where they had started. By the telephone pole looking at me with an emotionless face. And just like that they were gone. I watched the cameras for hours after watching to see if they showed up again. As you could imagine I didn't leave the guard house until morning. They might have only been young girls but something about them did not seem right. Three creepy girls let's not meet again. I work at a hotel and the building I work at was built in the 1800s. While I was downstairs collecting coffee station supplies, I felt like someone, an anxious someone, was pacing beside me because I heard shuffling in the room beside the shelves I was collecting from. I got very nervous because I thought someone else was down there with me, even though you had to have a key to even get downstairs and into that storage area. I gathered what I needed as quickly as I could and started to fast walk out until I heard footsteps running behind me. I turned around and slammed my back against one of the double doors, items still in my arms. Depending on the attack, I was prepared to defend myself, but there was no one. Then I heard what sounded like a man scream in the stairwell going back upstairs. I was paralyzed. I dropped everything to pull the radio out of my hoodie and called for security to come get me. If I couldn't pull myself from the spot, then he could, and I didn't want to be alone up those stairs. He said that was the whitest he'd ever seen a white person get. This happened sometime between 2012 and 2014. I would have been in my late 20s at the time, living in a share house in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. I worked nights packing shelves at a supermarket, a job I absolutely hated but had kept up all through university. In fact, I'd actually graduated in early 2012, but I found I was too lazy to just quit. I ended up spending those last few years in the share house kicking around, working this crappy dead-end job, waiting for everyone to go their separate ways so my life could start. After each shift, I'd catch the bus home from work at around 11pm, get off at the top of the hill, at the shops, then walk down the hill towards home. It was only about a 10 minute walk home from the bus stop, and I only mention all these details because I probably caught that bus and made that same walk a thousand times in all the years I held that job, this was the only time anything even remotely creepy happened. I'd hopped off the bus and was headed downhill with the cemetery on my left and a row of simple, one and two story homes on my right. I almost never saw any people at this time of night, that's how quiet the area was. The way is also well lit, and despite a cemetery looming over your shoulder, there's nothing eerie about it. In fact, it's quite a beautiful, well-tended cemetery, filled with interesting old markers, statues, and other things. You'd see people jogging or walking through it most days. The cemetery's bordered by a sandstone wall that follows the way downhill, then left along this coastal road that sort of loops back around. I was maybe halfway down the hill when a plain white van drove past on my left. At first, I thought nothing of it. I didn't break pace, and the van didn't stop or slow as it went past. I watched the tail lights grow small, sweeping left as it took the bend at the bottom of the hill. But as soon as it disappeared, I had this very odd feeling come over me that I was going to see it again. I'm not sure how else to describe that. It wasn't like a voice in my head or anything, just an odd, fleeting impression that when I got to the bottom of the hill, the same white van would be waiting for me. So, I got to the bottom, turned left, and saw a pair of headlights coming back towards me. They were too far to see if it was the same car, but immediately I knew it was. I didn't feel scared or anything, but I knew then that whatever was about to happen was going to happen, whether I wanted it to or not. Again, just a fleeting impression. This time, the van slowed and came to a stop at the side of the road. There was a young guy driving. I can't remember whether the passenger side window was already open or whether he leaned over to open it, but either way, he leaned across and called to me to come over. All I thought in the moment was that he probably needs directions, but as I approached, I immediately began to feel very uneasy. That gentle impression I'd felt earlier, watching the van drive past, 
has now solidified into a vague feeling of dread. I felt as if I shouldn't get too close, so I came about as far as the grassy verge, then stopped. I remember the radio in the car was playing, just some random pop song. He might have reached over and turned it down, I can't remember. I also don't remember too much of what he looked like, to be honest, except that he was maybe about my age or a little older, had longish blonde hair, and had a few days of growth on his face. He didn't strike me as threatening, so the unease I felt was more confusing at first. He spoke with a British accent. I just assumed he was a traveler. Excuse me, he said. Can you help me? I'm trying to get to the cemetery. Do you know where I can find the cemetery? Now I was really confused. Just over his shoulder, on his right, less than 20 feet away, the tops of grave markers and crypts poked above the sandstone wall. Like I said, the way was well lit, and he would have definitely seen the cemetery as he drove this road a moment before. In fact, he'd driven down to the far end of it, then made a U-turn, that's when I'd seen him coming back. At the other end, where the road loops around the coast, the wall wasn't high, and you could clearly see all the graves, even in the dark, stretching back up the hill. It made no sense. I was just about to answer when my blood absolutely ran cold. I froze mid-word, my mouth hanging open. Somewhere in the back of the van, I could clearly hear a woman screaming and crying for help. I could even hear her banging against the inside paneling. I heard it clear as day over the radio. I knew it wasn't a recording, but it was also somehow strange and seemed slightly unreal to me. Again, not too sure how to explain it. I definitely heard it, and it scared the hell out of me, but I didn't react the way I thought I would. I looked at him, and he just stared back and said nothing, making no effort to explain the screams or even acknowledge we were hearing them. But there was no mistaking it. I could still hear it clearly as we stared at each other. Sorry, I've no idea, was all I could get out. He nodded, said, thanks anyway, and drove off. I ran the rest of the way home, which, thankfully, was only two minutes away. When I got in, I was out of breath and shaking. My flatmates were all asleep, and I went straight to my room. If there had been even 1% of doubt in my mind, like maybe I'd imagined it, I would have probably woken someone first and at least told them what happened. Instead, I called the police. I had to explain the story to two different cops, long story short, because of a jurisdictional thing, my area actually fell under a police station further away than the local one I'd called. They took it seriously, took all my details, and said they'd send a car to look for this van. Unfortunately, I hadn't seen the license plate number, in the moment, I hadn't even thought to check, stupidly, and my description of the driver wasn't much more detailed than what I've described here now. Though they had my details, the police never called back to follow up, and nothing showed up in the news or any newspapers. When I told my flatmates about it, I left out the strange feelings of dread and just stuck to the details. They mostly thought I'd been pranked somehow, and while I guess that's possible, to this day I know that's not what happened. It's one of those had to be their things, but the whole thing felt so unusual and didn't play out like any kind of prank. The whole thing lasted not even three minutes from when he first drove past to when he drove off, and our interaction lasted probably not even 20 seconds. But it stayed with me for years, and I often think about it, wondering what happened. I've thought about it a lot over the years, and my gut tells me that there was something else going on. What I mean by this is that I don't actually believe there was anyone screaming for help in the back of the van that night, but I 100% swear on my life that what I heard was a woman screaming and crying for help, and that it was coming from the back of the van. I actually don't think the driver could hear it either. But what that means, I really don't know. Anyway, that's my story. Like I said, I've got a few others, but this one is the most dramatic, and I suspect it will stay with me the rest of my life. I'm the night miller in a flour mill. Our mill has been running since the 1870s, with upgrades in the 20s and 30s. Everything is still hand-adjusted, there are no computers or automation other than the stop-slash-start and the production scales. Milling used to be an extremely dangerous profession, and it's still not one of the safest. That's a bit of backstory. I catch flashes of people walking around out of the corner of my eye three to four times per week, at the end of the roller mill line, on the other side of the sifter line, on the next flight of stairs, etc. There's only four of us in the building at night, so I know it's not my co-workers, as they'd have no business in the areas I'm talking about. About six months ago, I was dropping the measuring tape in the flower bins to figure out how much space we had left because we hadn't gotten any trailers to load in a while and were tight on space. While I was squatting down and reading the tape, I noticed legs out of the corner of my eye. They approached and stood next to the bin hatch, waiting for me to be done with my math. I figured it was our loader. Come up to see if we are going to run out of space. I finished up and rolled up the tape, stood to talk to him, and by the time I was standing and turning, 
whatever it was had faded away and vanished. This was a solid presence, I 100% saw pants and work boots while I was concentrating on my tape and math. It wasn't hostile or anything, I was just interested in what I was doing. That's my spooky story. At 19, I was hired for the role of a correctional officer, one of the youngest there was at the time, working at the most dangerous prison in Australia. I had worked there for 40 years, 7 days a fortnight, 12 hour shifts. While it sounds like a pretty laid back role with easy money, the toll it takes on the mind is unimaginable, to the point where no money could encourage me to redo my time working there. There were good times when the men I worked with would better themselves and make something out of their lives afterwards, but I saw all manner of things, from courtyard fights to murder and suicide, but none of that stuck with me through my time there. You would think so, but no, the one thing that stuck with me through my time there was a short-lived and supernatural experience. There was not a single drop of blood spilled during this experience, yet it was one of the most horrific and graphic things I have ever witnessed. It was a night shift, come in at 7 p.m., finish at 7 a.m. We very rarely do night shifts, and this was my first one since finishing training. What usually was a staff of 200 people had dwindled down to about 30 by 10 p.m. We weren't left alone per se, but we generally did the rounds on our own every hour or so. I was prepared and ready to take on the night, and being the youngest on the team and presumably the most naive, there were rounds of light-hearted teasing directed towards me, you'll have aged to 60 by the end of the night. Be aware of the night crazies, young Padawan. The start of the shift was quiet, almost peaceful, with no issues or weird bumps in the night. The inmates were quiet, dead asleep in their cells. It was probably around 4 in the morning, and the tiredness was really starting to sink in when I saw the figure shift out of the corner of my eye, just outside the unit. At that point, I had just brushed it off as being sleep-deprived and left it to myself while the other staff members did their rounds. However, when I saw the figure move back to where it had initially moved, my alarm bell started going off quietly at this point. I turned in my chair to face the windows that looked out into the courtyard and focused my eyes on where I saw the figure move, attempting to peer through the darkness. I saw it, just a shadow, but there was something there. Now, usually, if we see something strange, we should radio it in, in case it was a lost inmate, but this wasn't a human figure, so I put it down to maybe being an animal, which, as large as it was, was incredibly unlikely. This was a maximum security prison, nothing larger than a rat should be getting in. It took my tired brain longer than it should have to process this information. The alarm bells, which just moments before were a simple, quiet whisper of something may be wrong, were now blaring. My now fatigued mind and body were awake, every nerve burning, ready to take action. I leaned over to the control panel and flipped on the outside lights. Nothing. Nothing was there. Just me and my embarrassingly labored breathing filled the unit. My radio crackled. My supervisor had seen the lights flipped on in the unit she was currently doing rounds in. I had told her I thought I had seen something moving outside, but it was most likely just my eyes playing tricks on me. She had laughed back and said something that caused my skin to break out in a chilled sweat. We said to be careful of the night crazies. This is a lonely time, and the crazies are lively tonight. Really, it's a sentence that doesn't entirely make sense unless crazies is a descriptive word for someone or the name of something. I brushed it off as she and the team were trying to spook the literal new kid on the block, but still something lingered inside of me that told me that something was not right. I had half an hour of tainted peace before the next encounter with this shadow, except this time it wasn't outside. It had started as a simple, quiet tapping. Maybe it was the wind, but if it was coming from the inside, then maybe one of the inmates was awake and bored. During the day, the inmates would cause a muck if they were confined to their cells, from tapping to banging to blood-curdling screams. The thing was, after a few minutes of thought, it was coming from one of the unoccupied cells. I was still alone at this point, but my unit partner should have been arriving back soon after finishing their rounds. I had stared at that cell door for a few minutes, trying to determine what to do. When the tapping suddenly stopped, my previously furrowed brow softened into a picture of surprise, but mostly relief. Almost immediately after relaxing, the scraping started, a long, painful sound, like someone drawing their nails across a blackboard. I cringed at the sound initially, but then panic took over. It wasn't a loud and deafening sound, but it was there, it was happening when it shouldn't have been. I racked my brain on what to do. Radio in, strange noise coming from an unoccupied cell, going to investigate. My unit partner gave their affirmations and reported that there would only be a few more minutes, that it was probably nothing, and that I didn't need to wait for them to check in on the cell. I wish they had asked me to wait. I stood and walked over to the cell in a daze, without even a single hesitation. This outward confidence was at war with my insides, my heart pounding, my brain screaming for me to stop, and my lungs burning for air. 
My stomach was tied up in knots, and even with all these warnings that something was terribly, terribly wrong behind that door, I didn't stop myself from reaching for the latch. I opened the door, I hadn't turned on the cell light, they all turned on at the same time, and I didn't want to wake the inmates. The only light that poured in from the central unit was blocked by its shape, blocking most of it and letting a few dim streams through. I stepped in. I don't know why, we aren't allowed to step into a cell before inspecting it, but I did it anyway. I stepped inside and into the corner to let more light in, and I saw it. It was facing away from me, a crouched humanoid figure, its skin was a sickly green or grey color, its knees bent backwards, the kneecaps facing towards me. Its limbs were long and skinny, and its joints had large bulbs protruding from underneath its skin. It didn't even acknowledge me, it just raised its long arms up above its head, placed the tips of its grotesque digits against the concrete wall of the cell, and ever so slowly dragged its fingers down. I had been silent until this point, the fingers were halfway down their path when I let out a small gasp. It paused, just for a second, then started to stand, its perverted knees cracking as it did. I was frozen. Its head was sitting on a dangerously long neck that was almost the length of its demented body, it had to stoop so that its head wouldn't hit the roof. Then it started to turn, but just before I saw its face, the room went black. The door had shut, and I crumbled to the floor, screaming for what felt like hours, but it was really only 30 seconds, according to my unit partner, who had run to open the cell door. I was sent home early that day. I expected to hear something about it when I went back to work, but there was nothing. Not even light-hearted teasing. It was like nothing had ever happened. A few months after the event, when I had finally settled back into a normal routine, I did some research on the prison. Many old Australian prisons had wretched pasts filled with torture. This particular prison was notorious for, back in the day, abuse, torture, hangings, and riots. I wish I had not researched the history of the goal I worked at, because up until the point I had convinced myself that I was simply sleep-deprived, although that doesn't explain the cell door closing and locking. For the most part, the research brought up nothing too daunting, just the typical graphic and gruesome history of Aussie goals. However, I unearthed a diary entry that was written by a man from those dark times, and one of his last entries really was the nail in the coffin for me. It has stayed burned in my mind for these last 40 years. This is what his entry said. The walls we tap to make songs. Are these the same walls we scratch? Our nights are loops. And our hunger destroys our truce. They break our legs. And for daylight, we beg. Instead, they stretch out our necks. With their noose. Work part-time security at an outpatient facility. On average, I work at the hospital about six times a month. The money I make here is the money that I spend on myself, which is the only reason I have this job in the first place. I can go weeks without anything happening, then have a night where I'm constantly having something going on. Some of this can be rationalized. Other things, not so much. I have to do bi-hourly checks during a 12-hour shift. This requires me to walk around the facility, make sure that doors are locked, even though I already locked them, and basically document anything that may happen. On a human or physical level, this is very rare. Hospitals in general, of any kind, will always come with their share of despair in some capacity. I've worked here for maybe six to seven months, and I don't have an incredible amount of knowledge of the lore, so to speak. Most nights I'm in the hospital with two nurses and a maximum of about three patients. These are usually the most uneventful nights. Then, at least once every two months or so, I'll be in a position where I have to guard the facility by myself. There are two stories I'm aware of. One is about a patient who passed away unexpectedly at the end of one of the corridors. I constantly have to open that door because it keeps closing. I'll open it, and when I go to do my checks, it'll be closed. I put this to the test one night by opening it, walking a circle around the corridor, and then going back to the room to find it closed. Yeah, I know. Call the travel channel. I can't be in a place where a door is closing. Dude probably just wants some privacy. One of the older nurses had a son who, ironically enough, passed away in the hospital after a surgery. That's a sad occurrence as it is, but before she quit, she said that she could sense her son's presence in the room that he passed away in. I assumed this was a coping mechanism on her part, but in that room, I can occasionally see a shadow moving from one corner to the other. These were the things you could possibly talk me into rationalizing to some degree. The next three things will have to be persuaded a bit harder. First, the thing that got me looking over my shoulder for a while was when I went into the break room to make a pot of coffee. My back was against the open room, and as I'm fumbling around for cream and sugar, I can hear what sounds like furniture being dragged across the tile floor. I turned around and expected to get no closure over what I heard, 
but I had the pleasure of seeing a chair move a good foot and a half by itself. I got out of there and went back to my post. I didn't bother with the coffee. I didn't know what else to do. The second thing was in the form of an apparition. I've never seen one before, and it bothered me for days. I was conducting my checks on the facility when I found my way down the same corridor that I mentioned earlier. I was checking a few of the rooms when I turned and saw a white shrouded figure standing in the doorway, about five feet from me. I dropped my keys and flashlight on the ground and sort of tripped into the adjacent room. I was still processing what it was. But when I looked back, the doorway was empty, and upon further observation, there wasn't anybody in the hallway, which I already knew but still needed to confirm. I further inspected the room and also did a recheck of the facility just for my own reassurance. Nothing. I was the only one there. The last thing is hands down what scared me the most. There is a storage room in the middle of the hospital. I hate this room for a variety of reasons. The main one being that whoever designed the plans for this building stuck a light switch in the dead center of the room, and when I have to turn it off, I have to navigate my way out in the dark. This room gets pitch black once the lights are off. One night I went into the room to make sure the back door was locked, and when I shut the lights to lock the room down for the night, in my ear, clear as day, I heard. Shh. I could feel the presence of someone behind me. My ears responded as if somebody were right in my ear, saying it at a forced, loud whisper. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's the only way I can describe it. I made sure I was out in the hallway before I shined my light in the room. Nothing again. I would later put a small figure of the Virgin Mary in the room underneath one of the shelves, as well as a medal of St. Francis de Sales that I got for my confirmation about 12 years ago. Since then, I haven't had any experience in that room. I welcome any and all skepticism. I'm skeptical myself in a lot of instances, but this is what night shift at the hospital can entail. There are knocks, there are footsteps, and there definitely seems to be a presence here, and I'm not the only one who has experienced it. This is probably the creepiest, most unexplainable thing that has ever happened to me. I used to work overnight as a security guard at the local port. Usually none of the port workers would stay overnight except for the safety official. I wouldn't be on the shift alone since the site has a radius of nearly two miles. Overnight, usually there would be three guards, including me. Since the area was fairly big, there were different posts, but front gate was the main entrance area where all of the guards would be stationed overnight since there was no need to put them in other posts due to the fact that there was no activity on the site at this time. The veteran guards that have been there for years would often say that the site was haunted, given the fact that there have been accidents and deaths that occurred in the area a long time ago. I was aware that people died there due to freak accidents, and I do believe in angels and demons since I'm actually a religious person, but I always thought that the superiors were just messing with the new guys. I would work five to six nights out of the week, and for the first few weeks, I never really saw or heard anything out of the ordinary, except for maybe a few questionable creaks, and I would see a few misplaced objects while doing my patrol rounds, but nothing too crazy. Just to describe the setting to you, this is a fairly big site, and on occasions when there were big projects being constructed at the port, the workers would sometimes stay overnight. Due to the fact that there were times when port workers were required to stay at the port for a few days, there's a gym on site for their convenience. This gym is fairly old. In the gym, there's a sauna, weights, and even a racquetball court. If you don't know what a racquetball court is, it's similar to an indoor tennis court with thin plastered walls and thick glass doors. Usually on our patrol rounds, me and one of the other guards, Mike, would stop by the gym and play a few rounds of racquetball before returning back to the front gate. On one of those nights, Mike and I decided to hit a full workout instead of playing racquetball in the cage. This is around 2.30 a.m., and the entire building is so quiet that you can hear the electricity running through the lights. The air conditioner is off, and so is everything else. The only thing that's running are the lights. 15 to 20 minutes into the workout, we hear a loud thump. We crossed it off as nothing and continued working out. Then, after a few more minutes, we heard the loud thump once more. At first, we thought it was our lieutenant, who could have been walking around, but then we radioed him, and he gave us his location, which was front gate. We tried thinking logically about what could be making those thumps on the wall. They were coming from the court on the other side. We thought it was the air conditioner, but then we remembered that it was off, and even when it switched on during the day, there's no report of thumps coming from the air conditioner. After a few more minutes, the thumps started occurring one right after another. We were very creeped out at this point, but what we were about to witness still scares the absolute shit out of me to this day. We started to approach the other side of the gym to see where the glass door was. We turned on the flashlight and aimed it towards the clear glass door, and I got chills all over my body, and I started tearing so much out of fear that I was about to cry. 
we saw one of the balls rolling slowly by itself inside the court, but there was no one in there. So that means the loud thumps were the balls mysteriously being tossed against the wall as if someone or something were playing inside the cage. We were both so confused and frightened by how this was really happening, we couldn't make sense of any of it. We were scared shless, and we started yelling and running away because we knew that there was probably something evil toying with us right there. As we sprinted full speed back to the front gate, the lieutenant saw us and asked why we were tearing and running in a ridiculous manner. We told him what we witnessed, and his facial expression scared us even more. He then said, that's why there's always guards that quit often, there's something evil in the area. And it's not the first time that something that bad has happened here. He then showed us security footage of dark figures and shadows literally passing through the office areas and lights mysteriously switching on and off. To this day, I still get chills recounting my experience with my friends and family, and I'm even getting chills right now as I'm typing this. I had never had a real encounter with the supernatural until that night. Many say that it was a demonic presence messing around, others say it was the ghost of a dead person who died in the area. I don't know what it was, but I didn't last long in the job after that.